Hi, and welcome to Downtown New Jersey's Downtown Management Forum, uh, an event that we try to do about monthly uh, that brings together experts uh, and professionals in the downtown space to talk about hot topics. Today, we have part two of preparing for the post uh, pandemic with Jeff Bueller, who runs the Neighborhood Preservation Program in the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. Uh, before we get started, just want to introduce those of you who might not be familiar with Downtown New Jersey to our organization. We are a member-supported nonprofit. Uh, we provide educational materials through webinars like this, a conference, newsletter, et cetera. Uh, we also like to recognize our members through the newsletter and awards and social media shares. Uh, and then a little bit about advocacy. I wanna just jump into a couple of initiatives that we're uh, concerned about right now. One is legislation that's making some ways uh, that would impose prevailing wage on tax incentive projects. This will have significant impact on redevelopment and affordable housing in downtowns. Uh, we've also for, for a number of months now been discussing liquor license reform and more equ equitable access to liquor license. Uh, this will be critical to economic recovery and stability. So if you want more information, please go to our website, downtownnj.com. Uh, both of these initiatives, we're trying to build a coalition of organizations that uh, feel like-minded on the two pieces of uh, policy. So please check it out and sign up for the coalition. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to toss it over to Jeff Bueller uh, to give you a little uh, brief synopsis of what happened in part one and then kick off part two of this discussion. Jeff? So, la so last time, I was going to say last week, but as someone alluded to before, time's really flown. It was a couple weeks ago. Was it three weeks ago already or two? I don't remember. Two. Uh, two weeks. Jeez. Wow. Wow. Um, we, we talked about uh, the first two uh, aspects of what I called the takeaways for preparing for the post pandemic. The first one was get together and the second one was get ready. So get together basically had to do with aligning, aligning your assets, aligning your resources, aligning your partners. If you're a, a district management organization or, or, or an, any entity that is working towards district management in an urban, rural, suburban area, it doesn't matter. Um, it talks about how we get our act together to use the polite term on the interior of the organization with bylaws and policies and, 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 and just sort of figuring out, you know, what our level of commitment is and, and, and getting that teed up now during this sort of pandemic transition that we're, that we're all experiencing. Um, taking advantage of the sort of the, the pause button that we've been, we've been given in this horrible situation, but, but using that time productively to get together and to align and get ready. The second point was about basically just laying the groundwork, figuring out, you know, some of the big picture stuff, but also some of the small picture stuff that you can do now to line up the funds, the, the resources, the, the approaches uh, and, and sort of the work plan uh, to make visible and, tang tang nah, visible and tangible change happen in your districts. Um, and then today, we're transitioning into the intermission, I guess, because we put an intermission in it um, uh, to the, the two final topics, which are, so after you've gotten together and after you've gotten ready, I say get found and then be open. And so we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit, bit about that and, and learn a little bit about that today. And again, at the end, I'll look forward very much to any questions or comments or critiques uh, and uh, enjoy. Great, thank you, Jeff. And so for everybody, this is a video presentation and then we will bump on to discussion like we always do after the presentation. Uh, since it is a video, we recommend that you turn off your own video so that you're not using up to- Now let's talk about getting found. Look at what's our district online presence. What's the information that we share? How do we share it? And do we have a commerce component to that online presence? Then, and this is where it gets really crazy, you gotta look at all the businesses in your district and do the exact same assessment. What's their business online pre pre presence? Is it an informational presence or is it a, a presence that engages in commerce? directly or indirectly, just how does it support commerce, right? So that's just the online side. And the other part about getting found is the district appearance and ease of accessibility. How does the district look? How does it feel when it snows with the sidewalk shovel? 
Are there places for people to sit safely? Sit outside or otherwise temporarily congregate in a safe manner outside, principally, at this stage. Are there trash bins? Are there outdoor hand sanitizer stations, for example, in that district, or hand washing stations? I know in NPP, several of our communities uh, used federal uh, coronavirus relief fund money through our program to do just that, to build an outdoor hand sanitizing infrastructure in their districts and to great success. The same thing for businesses. What is, how does the business appear? Can you see in, can you see in to the storefront, right? How accessible is it? Does it feel safe? Does it feel inviting? Again, the same thing. Is there outdoor heating, outdoor seating, all the, all the necessary amenities or the potentially necessary amenities, depending on the type of business that it is, are they doing retail outside? Is it done in a way that is visibly enticing and inviting? And then you wanna look at district programming. How are, we, how are we programming the district? How do we program the district? How do we program the district in a, in a way that is safe during a pandemic that is in fact still raging and that will be with us for some time? How do we, how do, we do that? What are, the, what are the steps we can take to make that happen in a way that keeps people engaged, but does it, again, safely and not making a public health situation worse? So, get found. What do we do now? Work to make your district fully accessible, inviting, and comfortable. Build and enhance to remove barriers and provide ease. Parentheses, a sense of safety and health and well-being. So that's lighting, that's seating, and that's doing it all authentically. So if you're, if you've got an African-American cultural district, like we do down in Cape May, it's part of our MPP program, and you are looking to do something authentically, well, you're going to invest your resources into, for example, finishing and opening the Harriet Tubman Museum, which was done this summer, or restoring the AME Church and turning it into a uh, an African-American Cultural and Arts Center in Cape May, which is on the docket moving forward. You're gonna leverage your actual assets. You're gonna be you, you wanna be true to be you, okay? And those are physical things that help you get found. So there's the online world, and then there's that physical realm world where you can make changes and you can do you could start doing them now or you could start planning and funding looking for funding now the same thing you want to make your businesses fully accessible inviting and comfortable also for example with visible and transparent storefronts for all that is holy please Please, 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 no more tinted glass. It is not necessary. It totally, it totally blocks people's access and comfort with your business. Some places are awesome stores. They have awesome windows, but you can't see them. And anyone who's ever worked with me in the last 25 years know that one of, one of my rules is this, you don't obstruct first floor view into the business. You never do it. You don't do it with signage. You don't do it with tinted glass. You don't do it with closed, fully closed security grates. Whatever you can do to keep that open is your number one advertising and marketing tool for that storefront business, hands down. Now to be clear, if you're living in an area with high crime or perception of high crime and people are barricading their storefronts to, pr 
protect their merchandise, their, their employees as they perceive it. Sometimes you gotta have security grates. But there are plenty of options for interior security grates that don't obscure the outside and still allow you to see through the window, as well as exterior security grates that are effectively like giant rectangular chain links. So nobody can break in there. They might break the glass if it's interior, but nobody can break in there and steal stuff because of the way the grates are done, but yet people can still see in at night because it's well lit up and because you hopefully don't have tinted glass. So that said, if you are in a situation where you do have a lot of security grates down and they're solid and they're on the outside and there's just no money or, or will to change that, at a minimum, paint those puppies. Use them as a mural opportunity, sort of a pop down, sort of a pop up mural, a pop down mural, so that when those grates come down every night and maybe they're over the weekends, whenever they're down, you've got a, a wall of art in your district. It's a simple thing. It's been pioneered in New York City and other places around the world. Um, doesn't cost a lot of money. It's paint. It engages your local artists and artisans, possibly even the business, business owner or property owner, and uh, makes a real place value difference and ultimately economic value difference in your district. Because the cost of a, of a store seeming to be closed because of heavily tinted glass, no lights on, security grates, etc. The cost of that store, that store is immeasurable in terms of marketing, in terms of ultimately growing their clientele and making sales and making money. So the more we can have that storefront open, or at least engaging, if not open, the better. Make sure those storefronts have lights on into the evening. If possible, 10, if possible, 10 p.m., but definitely 8 p.m. if they're not otherwise open. And that's all week long. And that's whether you're an urban district or rural district. That's whether you're a small town like Frenchtown or a big city like Jersey City. It doesn't matter. When you're doing store design or redesign as you reopen or adapt your opening in, in this sort of pandemic and eventually post-pandemic world. Businesses really need to focus on their point of sale and curbside pickup access. It's got to be a massive priority because people are going to want to get in, get their stuff, get out. The days of kind of random browsing for most people are probably in the rear view mirror at this point. Okay, they might pre-browse on the internet, so back to being online, but for the most part, people are going to call, they're going to come in, they're going to know what they want or know basically what they want, and you're going to be able to get them to that thing fairly efficiently, get them to buy that thing, and then out they go. If it's a curbside pickup scenario, again, how can we make that easy? How can we make that easy for people to do curbside pickup? Yeah, now we're getting into ordinances, perhaps, and parking, uh, temporary drive-up spots, things like that. But these are things that we should think about now so we can get ready to perpetuate them in a way that is long-term and not just for, oh, we got approved for a couple of months because the situation has changed the way people are, how they shop, how they do business, how they do commerce, and how they engage in, in, in districts, period. So let's think about these things now and let's build these things for the future as well. One other thing that can be done is how do we how do we use our space differently? Because maybe not all the businesses are open right now and, and maybe some will never be open again and maybe others are, are home-based businesses now but were retail before but yet still need a storefront. How do we do that? So we're going to take a look at a couple examples here in Frenchtown uh, of how, and talk about how that's done as well. So here's an example of a business that had to shut down its uh, sort of public facing component with diners and things like that but but they use the window to highlight what they offer as a catering company and as a, a, a local distributor distributor of, of fine foods to uh, other retail establishments in town so it's, otherwise it'd just be a vacant window it's lit up at night engages the eye and shows some pretty tasty looking stuff too it's a great way of making lemonade out of lemons 
Now, as far as district programming goes, I'll show you some photos of the mule over the winter holidays. So what Love Frenchtown did, and what I helped out with as a volunteer, is we, we made that corner of the downtown, that key corner on Bridge and Harrison, into like a pop-up icon. Well, the, the, the painted mule is always there, and people know us for that, as far as icons go. Um, but we really th themed it out for the winter holidays. We had a Hanukkah menorah, we had a Christmas tree, we had a solstice, solstice sun, um, and it was all lit up and festive. People photographed that thing with themselves in front of it like nobody's business. It was a joy, you could tell. It was a joy for families, long, long time residents and area residents, uh, random visitors. People found it a really cool thing. Now, that's a form of programming. It's a physical thing, it's a place value thing, but it's a form of programming. So normally what we'd have is Santa shows up on this river, right over there, under that bridge. Uh, that's the Delaware River for those who don't know. Um, Santa shows up basically like on a kayak or canoe or some, some kind of flotation thing, and then gets off the, you know, gets back to land, and then goes up to the, the park just north of this bridge here, and, uh, and then would have kind of a Santa kids experience, you know, for the local kids. Obviously during COVID, you're not having that, right? So, so how, how did Frenchtown adapt? Well, so we created this, this display on the corner. Oh, by the way, the, the super giant Christmas tree and all of that stuff would be down in the same park with Santa. So it became like, that was the icon, that was the park, that was the place. That's where crowds would gather and have this experience. Obviously during a pandemic, you can't do this. So, so we, adapted this, we adapted that theme into the corner, uh, added a mailbox for Santa letters. Uh, so it was an actual place where kids could come and if they're into that kind of thing, put a letter into Santa. And, and then had the tree and the menorah and the solstice stuff. And, and again, it became, it became a really popular place for people to go in dribs and drabs, not in large groups, more safely, to, to do that. And, and to have that experience and to, and to have that feel. Then, oddly enough, Love Frenchtown organized with the person who portrays Santa, let's phrase it this way, um, uh, kind of online Zoom calls with, with kids that wanted to kind of have their Santa time and uh, they read the they read the Santa letters out uh, and all kinds of other stuff. So so they adapted it in the virtual realm as well, but from a practical purpose for downtown, the the concentration of the holiday theme on that corner served as a as a uh, public health safe oriented way to achieve the same kind of feel and vibe in the district but not have the giant crowds and put people at risk. So to sum up on programming, focus less on packed and more on passive, passively enjoyable things, which are probably gonna be physical. It could include things like music, people playing music. We had a bagpiper marching around, around downtown and, and guitarists and, and, and other things at various times over over the winter, winter weekends and or I should say the December weekends and the early holiday period um, nothing that would really draw a crowd per se or that people would drive from miles around to see but if they knew about it and they timed their visit they would get to experience a piece of that a piece of that vibrancy so we talked about being open, be open. What can we do now? Well, incentivize and market e-commerce, both district-wide and for businesses. Again, there are a lot of great examples out there. One of my favorites is from Canada, which is Collingwood, collingwoodcommons.com. Not Collingswood, that's New Jersey, Collingwood commons.com. It's a great story behind that I could tell you offline. Um, more locally, relative to New Jersey and, and certainly our metro area, Cinch, C-I-N-C-H market, cinchmarket.nyc uh, is basically an Amazon for 
local businesses in NYC that you know has delivery rolled in among other things. Definitely worth taking a look at if you're if you're in a more urbanized, uh, d more densely populated area as a potential model. And then in Westfield, they work with Beyond Maine to uh, set up a e-commerce site for uh, many of their businesses, which is uh, kind of ramping up and having some more success over time. So I'll I'll post that uh, I'll post that link up for you uh, in in Westfield. A um, bunch of examples of district-wide or area-wide e-commerce marketing and incentive incentivization. Okay, you know the incentive for the business to be involved with that district-wide program is you get to survive. Um, we would hope that would be incentive enough. One of my favorite things that you can ramp up basically at no cost, or pretty much at no cost, um, if you don't use any subsidy, is an e-gift card program. There are a lot of purveyors of this, and I obviously can't recommend any in particular, but in Frenchtown, what we did was we, we worked with a place called Gifty, and uh, we created an e-gift card program in the span of about seven days. And we now have close to 30 businesses signed up for it, and they uh, all can, can take this e-gift card, either as a printed thing, if somebody wants to print it, or they can, they can read it off the phone, or if somebody calls, they can enter the credit card number online, and it's exclusively for use in these about 30 businesses in, in Greater Frenchtown, so that are all members of the, uh, the nonprofit um, management entity, Love Frenchtown. So it allows somebody who loves Frenchtown and loves this district, this community, this area, this region, because you know there's the actual borough, but then there's sort of what people perceive as Frenchtown. To give that gift, or receive that gift, or even buy that gift for themselves, and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna get that $50 gift card for Love Frenchtown, and I'm gonna spend it in three or four different places, maybe not even the same day. Um, they can use it online, they can use it in store, they can use it on the phone. It's a really great system, and again, no barrier to entry because it's absolutely free. And I'm sure there are many other programs like that out there as well, uh, but that's certainly one that um, we've been using in Frenchtown uh, to modest success. I will say that the e-gift card programs that are subsidized, meaning like buy one, get one free, or if you buy a $50 gift card, you get $10 tacked on, and it's sponsored by our local realtor or in the case of my program, the Neighborhood Preservation Program, like we did down in Woodbury, uh, where they, where the local NPP doubled, doubled the amount up to I think fifty dollars uh, for gift card e-gift card purchases, which then could be used only in those district businesses again. So it's driving the money right back into the community, um, but with flexibility. Uh, that you know, having that subsidy is extremely successful, and. It's, uh, it definitely makes a big difference when it comes to um, running an e-gift card program or any kind of gift card program is when you can match or double that money. But the fact is, is that if you don't have that, you can still get it up and running and it's still a great tool that promotes the, the economic viability of the community as well as sort of the civic, the civic buy-in to the community in addition to that. Because, because again, it's branded to your districts, whether it's a sub-district within a city, a larger city, um, like the Columbian District in our MPP area in Elizabeth, which is a sub-district of Midtown, which is a sub-district of the overall community of Elizabeth. Um, you can have a card that just works in businesses in that sub-district, uh, brand it for that sub-district, and creating a sense of a sense of connectivity and, uh, again, civic pride, uh, as well as bringing some economic juice to the table for that district. It's a great tool, subsidized or not. Certainly, if you subsidize it, it'll take off a lot faster. That I can assure you. Because at the end of the day, if you're online, you're open. You are being open. And that is half the battle, and certainly the key fourth point of what we've talked about today. So when we talk about be open, what we mean is you have to be accessible to the public, to the people who are gonna buy your stuff, access your services or goods. So being open is about your physical presence, your storefront, but it's also about your online presence. Can you be found? Can your district as a whole be found? Are you open in that sense 24 seven? Um, how do you stay open? Like we have a couple great restaurants in Frenchtown that they had to close. They just can't, ma they just can't make, make bank on the, with their staff and, and all their overhead during 
the January to March or June or, or March or um, April period, right? So what do they do? They they keep cooking, they keep making their great stuff, but then they take another business that's more retail, straight up retail, and they use that business to sell their food uh, collectively. And the entire community and region knows about this. So it's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. It's a way for them to effectively stay open, keep working, uh, pay the rent, but then ha have uh, lower overhead costs during this time. So now let's take another look at how businesses adapt and change and use their local assets to succeed even in these trying times. My local hardware store, Frenchtown Home Hardware and Outdoors is a perfect example of that. They've partnered with Maker's Alley over here in the front part of their store where they have art uh, made by local artisans and, and artists. Uh, and they basically serve as, a, as an exhibit space for them in part of the hardware store. Let's go inside and check things out. So Frenchtown Home Hardware and Outdoors is just fantastic. It has got at least one of everything you'd ever need. It is the classic and quintessential downtown independent hardware store and Mike the owner is just fantastic and the store itself is awesome but it's more than hardware so over here in the front of the store is an example of the partnership with Makers Alley now today it has mostly art Art, art as a gallery that people can purchase and obviously view and enjoy. Um, during the uh, winter holidays, there were probably a half dozen artists and artisans here with jewelry and other gifts. Uh, not so much hanging art, but wearable art that people can wear. Uh, this partnership with Makers Alley, which is a nonprofit, brings clients interested in the arts into the hardware store, which is so much more than a hardware store, benefits benefits the business, and it also provides a venue for Makers Alley and, and their artists and artisans and partners to show and sell their stuff. So again, not unlike the specialty store around the corner, Gourmand Epicure, Frenchtown Hardware is hosting key economic and social assets of the community, artists and artisans, within its own walls, taking up its retail space, but providing effectively an, an anchor sub-business within its main business. It's another fantastic way that businesses can partner, share square footage, and grow together, even during the pandemic. Again, the key takeaways in order, although they probably should be done parallel to some extent, get together, get ready, get found, and be open. Taking advantage of the situation we are in with the pandemic by doing those four things will give you a strong foundation for moving both your district as a whole and the businesses within that district forward to what is hopefully a more sustainable and prosperous future. Thanks for taking the time to listen today and I look forward to your questions.
and welcome back everybody. I, I was going through, I was waiting Jeff to see if there was like bonus footage at the end, some comedic thing, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time. Maybe, Maybe next, next time. time. So, so welcome back. This is the part where we, we have discussions. So it's, you know, normally let's start off with some questions for Jeff, if you have any, um, but also, you know, it, this is for sharing and dialogue and discussion. So if you have ideas or you have, are looking for advice, that's great too. We do have a very large group this time. So let's uh, make sure we try to stay on topic and, and be a little more concise, uh, just so that everybody who wants to share has an opportunity to share. So is there anybody who kind of wants to kick it off? Don't, don't all jump at once. <laughs> you can, and feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, talk. We're not overly formal here. Jeff, I want to know where you got that cool hat. Was it one of the Maker's uh, Alley products? No, no, that one my wife had uh, made for me a couple of years ago. Ah. I, oh, I, 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 I use that hat because it matches, matches our NPP brand and mask and everything that I made, so. I do see a question in the chat. Uh, the artwork painted on the metal retail doors, how was that financed? Right, so um, that can be financed a number of ways. Uh, the um, in some cases, a business owner or a property owner might choose to do that. Usually it's a business owner. Maybe they know an artist and maybe they can cook up a deal or something like that. Uh, in other cases, um, uh, there's a program called, I think, 100 Greats in, in New York City, for example, that, um, that I use some photos of. Uh, they, that's actually a nonprofit that, that raises money from a variety of sources and, and then uses that money to pay for uh, New York City artists to, to paint the greats in accordance with the, the goals of each business owner. So there's a, there's a bunch of ways. Um, obviously, if you run a downtown management organization and you have funding, um, you can do that. If you're in the NPP program and perhaps some other programs at the state, um, you can absolutely use, uh, use, use uh, at least NPP money for doing that, uh, as well as, uh, again, private donations or local government for that matter. Great. Uh, where can the inside security grades be found? Ah, yes. So, so I didn't, uh, I didn't call up a resource sheet for that, Antoinette, but, but basically um, you can just Google interior storefront security grates or something, some combination like that, uh, or ask Siri and, um, and, and it'll, you'll probably get a bunch of, a bunch of things that come up. I mean, the, the same people that do exterior grates tend to also do the interior grates as well. Uh, and again, the, uh, the sort of, I call it the chain link. It's not chain link. It's actually kind of round metal that, that forms kind of rectangles, um, almost like brick bricks, but, but they're empty. So you can see through them uh, and that are flexible. Uh, you can actually install them with a, with a roll down interior to the windows and it just drops down and fills the, fills the front of the storefront, maybe a couple inches back um, uh, all the way from ceiling to, to whatever the edge of the storefront or the floor is. Uh, that, that's certainly the best recommendation. Uh, and then otherwise, if, if, they're not, if people are not willing to put the, the, the grates inside the storefront, then you can still at a minimum replace the exterior grates with the see-through, again, chain link, I call it, grates uh, on the outside uh, as well. And that'll, it'll be equivalent to having an ex, a, a closed grate, but it, people will still be able to see the storefront at night with the lights on and all that. And I've seen them, Jeff, where, because, you know, sometimes the door is kind of inset and they have a display that they yes. just put a, a, you know, basically from the door and the space between the display window is kind of still out there, but it's all back one nice thing back behind the door, which is yes. cheaper than trying to fill in the, the uh, display windows. Cer certainly another, another option. Yeah. It looks like we've got another question, Courtney. Oh, let's. From, from Paula. Okay, uh, the district-wide gift cards, have we found a good program to suggest to our business associations would appreciate some links? I know Jeff doesn't want to give so, a specific well, I, I one, but- Well, I can't recommend, but they, they, they all have these weird names like G Gift Fly, Yifty. There's, a, there's the, like anything that's got a couple of weird vowels in it that sounds vaguely like gift, you can probably find it. Um, I mean, in Frenchtown, I can speak as a volunteer, we, we use Yifty. Um, our neighborhood preservation programs, a couple of them um, have and are using, have been and are using YIFTI as well. Uh, one of our neighborhood preservation programs actually just, well, two of them actually decide to print up their own gift cards. So they're not even doing online. They've printed up physical gift cards, Glassboro and Millville. 
Um, there are, you know, Square, there are a whole bunch of uh, modalities uh, for that. And I think I had a slide in there. I snuck a slide in there showing five or six of them. Um, you can certainly reach me offline. I could, I could share that slide with you or just go back and revisit this when Courtney posts it and, and screenshot that. that and you, you'll have at least five good examples, I think, that you could pull from. Okay, hey, Jeff, Nancy, hey, Nancy, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I, I'm great, thank you. That is awesome. <laughs> um, I just wanted to throw in, because I've started downtown um, gift cards in both Red Bank and here in Summit, um, there's a company called EML, E as in Eddie, M as in Mary, L as in, I don't know, love, <laughs> EML Payments USA. Um, you can Google them and they're really uh, the only one that does it. This is a Visa gift card program and they're the, really the only company that does it this way in the country. And it's so it's um, a straight up Visa card that can only be used almost like sort of like a mall gift card can only be used at mall businesses. They're the only ones who really do downtowns for a regular gift card. Like it's a Visa card, but it can only be used in the in the town and they do that by capturing the POS, the point of sale number from each participating mm. business. So they can't take a visa card and go to any other town to use it. Mm. No, that's, really, that's great. It's a great point. Yeah, it's really successful and it's a great way to have the money spent downtown. So just an extra tip. No, thanks. And, and so if you want a physical gift card, and I, I believe Nancy's correct, there were a couple of purveyors of physical gift cards, you know, even, you know, five years ago. and. And I think EML might be sort of the, like the last one standing of, of the physical gift cards. Again, um, I like the e-gift card because it provides infinite flexibility since you can, you can use it, you know, you can print it out physically or you can use it phone, internet, et cetera, uh, as long as it's tied to the point of sale uh, as the same thing with the, with, the, with the EML program. So yeah, there's a bunch of options out there, definitely. Great. There's another question in the chat. And by the way, you guys, you can all feel free to unmute yourselves and ask your questions, but I, I don't mind reading them either, but we're, we're, we're open that way. Um, so how do you see event planning playing out this year? Do you think there will be opportunities to have outdoor events and larger scale events this spring, summer, or fall? Wow. Well, I, I, I'm afraid uh, Dr. Fauci couldn't get on yeah. for a second um, <laughs> uh, onto our meeting. But uh, and again, I, I don't want to speak from a sort of a, a virology expertise standpoint because I have none. Um, but what I what I can tell you is um, I, I, I'm pretty conservative in that regard. Um, you saw I wore the mask whenever I was downtown during the presentation and so forth. I'm you know I'm extremely extremely intense about that. Uh, and um, I can say that in Frenchtown, love Frenchtown, the organization with 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 which I'm a volunteer, uh, we're not doing any major events this year. All of our major events, a couple that bring thousands of people to downtown, we're simply not doing. We're doing other things. We're doing other things. We're doing these smaller. So again more on the passive side, not the packed side, as I referred to in the, in, in the video. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, for, for me, I, I, if you ask my professional opinion, Ryan, I would not do any large scale events for this summer until we have absolute certainty of, of mass vaccinations being completed and being successful. That's just my take, but, but I'm, I'm not a virologist or a scientist. So, so I, I, you know, I, I, I would be really careful with that. You, Cause again, there's, think about this. If you, look, it's New Jersey people, we're the land of liability, right? So imagine you hold an event and somebody does get sick from some new strain of British COVID or, you know, whatever. And, 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 and then they get sick and something really bad happens. Well, they might hold us liable as the downtown people, right? For, for well, you, if you hadn't held that concert series and if Steve didn't go to the concert series and sit in this crowd of people, Steve might be you know, alive today or not be on a ventilator or whatever. So, so you have to consider the liability aspect as well um, while still figuring out a way to program and be fun. And again, I think I gave some examples of how we were able to finagle that in Frenchtown. Those are not the only ways forward, but I, but I would, I would, I personally would lean in, in that direction. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the, what we're hearing from the governor's office, is, you know, the, certainly outdoor stuff is still going to be requiring social distance, um, because he, he's waiting for the herd immunity. I think we got have to be at like 75% vaccination rate, um, before things are really going to start to get back to normal. So, you know, I think there were people who, who were even last summer doing 
bigger events, maybe not mm-hmm. the events they had been doing in previous years, but making sure, you know, um, metering how many people came in, if it was like a segment of blocks or right. a block right. or a park, um, and, and making sure that people social distance. And I think that's going to be the MO at least through the summer. Um, and I think we have to just continue to follow what's happening with the immunizations before we make, you know, I'm sitting here, we're trying to decide whether to do, you know, a real live in-person conference in the fall. And it's, it's hard because we just don't know, you know, even, even if the vaccinations are available, um, it comes down to people actually taking them. And we know that there is a large segment of the population who don't plan to take it. And so how do we ever get over that hump if we can't hit that, that whatever that percent is? Um, did you see, did you see Linda's comment? Yes. I was yeah, about yeah, to go good. to Linda's yeah. comment. Newark, uh, with support from the downtown district, just had a fantastic winter village with safe glass pods, music, safe distance games, uh, and food people could order from local restaurants. That's a nice way to do it is the, the ordering mm-hmm. to local restaurants. Sherry, I see you unmuted yourself. Are you going to jump in on something? I was just going to ask, um, you know, there's been so much discussion about the new world that we don't know the impact it's going to have on the business community. Um, and, you know, I heard Chris say that board meetings will probably be virtual from here out. Um, I'm curious uh, with the Main Street program, especially, which is based upon volunteer effort, um, are there um, things being done to uh, continue to engage volunteers when they n- can't necessarily show up to, uh, you know, run a big scale event or something like that. Mm. Well, I can't speak to that program, but in neighbor preservation program, we have what we call uh, NP- local NPP stakeholder teams. So a, a mix of your, you know, classic sort of downtown or district stakeholders that are um, not formally necessarily a nonprofit, but it's a, but it's a group that, that we mandate that they have. And, um, and those teams um, have generally been meeting online, just like we're doing now and engaging in project planning uh, and going over the budgets and, and, and looking at the kinds of things that they can do. So it's so again, they're looking at the assets they have in the context of the pandemic and what's safe. And, and they're trying to organize around those assets and about what is safe and potentially safe to do. So it's not ideal, Sherry. Um, Obviously, because, you know, a lot of volunteers, they want to be hands on, they want to actually go and be event security or help, well, generally never help do clean up, but help do maybe set up or something like that. Uh, and, and, and those opportunities are, are definitely fewer in between right now. And I think that's something that's impacting a lot of service oriented and people oriented organizations during this last year. It's been, it's been, it really has, it really ha- is, a, is a tough road to hoe. And I don't have an answer for you, but I think, I think being engaged digitally and seeing what we can do. At, at, in, a, in a safe arm's length, non-crowd way uh, is definitely the way to go for engaging volunteers. Um, if I may, I just wanted to yeah. share, I saw that Carla had put something up in the chat. Carla's our uh, executive director for the Highlands Business Partnership, the local C3. Um, and I just wanted to share with everyone that uh, both uh, the HBP worked with the borough uh, since this madness all began to try to retool a lot of the events that normally happen throughout the year to make them outdoors, uh, have contact tracing forms, and to just change our programming to make sure everything was spaced again out of doors and uh, have a way to do the contact tracing if God forbid anyone got sick. Um, So far, touching wood, that has not happened at any of our events. Uh, But it's just something that I'd like to share with everyone. It was very successful and people were very happy to have something to do um, that was still safe. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Stuart threw in some information about gift cards. It's very long. I think read it. (laughs) Go ahead and and, and check that out uh, to to supplement the gift card discussion uh, if that's something you're interested in. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Anyone else? Questions, thoughts, ideas? Need advice? Yeah, thanks, Courtney. That's Stuart. But yeah, I, if anybody wants to reach out to me, it is a, an interesting program. And thank you, Jeff, for putting together your presentation. Really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, and I was just asked if I can, uh, you know, share the chat comments, and that's something I can, I can certainly do. Um, 
Hey, they, we're not talkative today. To, hey, to Courtney. First, yeah, there, who, what, who said it's hi? Susan. Oh, I, there we go. Hi. <laughs> I don't have a question for Jeff, but I just want to say how much I really, really appreciated this video. Um, I think it's pretty groundbreaking in terms of um, how you approached this entire presentation and I, I loved it. I mean, I was literally glued to it. Um, I can't remember the last time I've been on a Zoom presentation and have been this captivated. <laughs> so, uh, so all the work that you put into it and it looks like you put a lot of thought and, and uh, production went into this. Although there was a, a unique rawness to it as well, which I, I think made it all that more intriguing and it was very authentic. Um, I think the information was presented so well, and uh, this was a great way to um, to present the information and, uh, you know, long, long live the video presentation now over the uh, the PowerPoint. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> to totally agree. I mean, well, it helps to live in a great town where you can use as a model, right? Um, and, you know, in spite of the flaws, and I'm sure the business owner who, who I pointed out has tinted glass is going to hate me on that, but, but, um, but thank you. That's that I appreciate that feedback. And, and yeah, it is, it is actually a lot more work than, than, than the, than the, the fit, there's a 50 minute video. And then there's the 20 hours of work that goes into the 50 minute video. Right. Uh, I will say, and, and Courtney will probably mention this at the end, but the extended version. So th this was actually the full sidebar version of the second half. Uh, the, the first version got retooled in the meanwhile, the first half, the first two sections, and there's an additional sidebar in there. So, so the entire thing together is 50 minutes and that extended version will be available whenever Courtney uh, posts it. Yes, um, I got to get it up there. Yeah, basically what we're going to have is each, each part with the discussion and then just the long form without the discussion. Uh, so people can watch however, however they please. Um, and those will all be up uh, uh, shortly. Um, we'll have to edit this video, uh, together, but I'll, I'll get the long form. Actually, I can do that this afternoon, get that up. Um, Jeff, can you, well, first I also, there was a comment, a uh, good idea to put these types of videos on bid SID websites to profile municipalities, local businesses, uh, to our wire audience. And they all have to find a Jeff who's capable of, of editing <laughs> video. I'm incapable of doing it. Luckily I have Rebecca who, who, who watched a YouTube video to figure out how to edit YouTube videos. It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> which I, I, as a Gen Z, I'm not into watching YouTube videos on how to, yeah, I like to read how to do things, but that's just me being old. Um, let's see, Jeff, can you share your process? Oh boy. Of creating the video editing <laughs> well, tips. How many well, takes? Well, 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 what I'd say, and for those of you that saw the first section with the star Wars intro, where I talk about how how I, I didn't learn until after I shot everything that my my selfie camera shows everything backwards. So mm. it's everything. So like my mask is neighborhood. Like, like I didn't, like I had no idea until I actually did it, did this. And I was like, well, there's no way I can flip it now and I'm not going back and doing it again. So, you, you know, you, you learn some of those things. And I think to Susan's point, it does add sort of like to the raw, to the raw edgy nature of it. And it's authentic, it's authentic. <laughs> you know, uh, nobody's perfect. Uh, and actually I think it's kind of fun, but, um, but yeah, I, I I basically spent a couple hours out out in town um, a couple of different times, but but then over time I took different photos and things, and then obviously did created some slides and some graphics and, and slipped them in there, and you know pulled stuff off the internet and and screenshotted it and then and folded it in there. So I mean the actual the actual filming of it, uh, you know after I wrote everything, and again I didn't write everything word for word, I, as you could probably tell, <laughs> I just I you know I I I just did my thing for 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 about half of it, but I wrote probably maybe about half. Uh, in advance, at least as an outline, um, that that you know the actual filming of it once that was done probably took maybe four hours, uh, you know, to find the sites and to find the, a time when the geese weren't entirely honking over me and all this other stuff and and so so you know you have to be you have to be flexible if you're doing it on site right if you're doing it in a room that's no big deal you can just crank it out so so any future videos that I do just you know for example like in my house or in my you know in a quiet space or something like that, that'll be a lot easier. Um, but certainly doing it on site is it definitely adds to that. And, and so how many takes? Uh, I just pretty much did everything, you know, in one shot. Uh, I mean, one shot multiple times in different locations. And, um, you know, I did have to do some voice dub over over one or two things in, in the first section, because, because the sound quality wasn't there. But uh, otherwise, it was just it was just raw, as you, raw as you saw it with just a little bit of snipping and and then obviously some fades and, and whatnot. And of course I had, I have friends who are great musicians. So I was able to roll some of their music into there as well, which I, which I just love. And I think it adds, adds to that anti-PowerPoint experience. Um, 
Great. Um, we have some more commentary in there. Uh, Pola uh, want to stress the importance of downtown Main Street businesses working together mm -hmm. um, going forward in cross pollination. Yeah, I think it's totally, you know, you guys are all in this together, all or the businesses in particular. And I know Pola's with a with a business as well as down to destination Medford. Um, you know, yeah, I think that's key. It's not competition. It's 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 more 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 people downtown, more butts and seats, right? Um, and then uh, Robin shared a, uh, a article about planning grants for municipalities. Uh, oh, who are those from? Is that from EDA? Um, um, I, I didn't check the link out, but I know I know EDA is launching a series of uh, massive planning grants for um, for municipalities and possibly even nonprofits. Um, uh, that's not official, so you didn't hear it from me. But uh, but yeah, I, I believe that uh, that's definitely coming down the pike. Great program right part of it i think it's real it's real there you go okay and, then you did and, hear from uh, it. we were we it's a great article i definitely and we're really honored to have been featured in it so prominently but um i think it would be great to learn more it sounds like it's it's that there will be money for for municipalities to do planning and this article was really about how whether municipalities would take advantage of that to hire experts to help with planning and uh, capacity building and everything else. And we, we would highly recommend it based on our recent experience at, with Stantec and, yeah. and with other planners, including Courtenay and some, I know there's other planners on the call. I think, um, I think we could all use that outside uh, in or high view looking down um, expertise help. Um, but while I, while I have the mic, I think uh, I'm really curious about how people feel about using video because I, I would love to do a tour of Flemington that, that's as great as your tour, Jeff, um, you know, for, with a public facing focus because I think people are stuck at home or they might be, you know, very, have very strict migratory patterns that they're following. And I think just even the visual of, of um, what our towns look like might be refreshing <laughs> to people and encourage them. Um, we're, we're still trying to communicate the ver variety of ways you can pay, you can visit, you can be shop, you can communicate, you know, it seems like that's really our toolkit is just explaining to a consumer um, how to make, you know, how to connect. Um, but uh, how, are people using videos to give I've seen it I'm, I'm not sure if she's still on. I'm trying to look. I know. Um, Oh yeah, Pam's still on. I I've seen on New Brunswick City Market short short videos um, that or city center, I mean, um, that they're doing. And I think the key is to keep it relatively short, mm -hmm. um, you know, like 30, 45 seconds, and that it has the, you know, the the closed captioning. And so that if people are scrolling through whatever social media medium they're scrolling mm -hmm. through, they just get this nice short snippet and it catches their attention. So if you are trying to hit, so maybe it's multiple videos, because I know you were talking about different, different aspects that you want to hit that you do multiple. I don't know, Pam, do you, are you, she's here, uh, but she might not actually, oh, I can jump in as well. Uh, yeah. So we started working with about three different independent uh, video people um, in the area. Uh, I also did some video stuff myself. Um, what we did is we would go out, we'd shoot for maybe 15 minutes at a restaurant or a local business, and then we clip them down to short segments so that they'd only be like a minute long so that we could share it through multiple different social media aspects. So we created the YouTube channel that we get them up there, but YouTube prefers longer type of things. And so we've got some other video plans where we're going to do three to seven minute long interviews with the owner describing what's going on and then have B-roll in the background. But the shorter stuff, no no uh, direct uh, voice audio. Everything's just like free based uh, music uh, aspects that we can use, but we share it through 
Instagram, through the reels, through TikTok. We started doing it through Facebook. Uh, we would jump on and do Facebook Live. If there was something compelling going on when we were doing our winter program, uh, we got a lot of involvement with ice sculptures. And that was something that, hey, they're going to put it together in 25 minutes. That's a good amount of time for Facebook Live because you're going to capture a good amount of people. And then, you know, people can go back to that. And that doesn't require editing. For the other items that we were doing, I downloaded InShot. Um, it was an app, $30 if you buy it right out. Um, and I just do all the editing on my phone. And I just go through the clips. I do short clips, like seven seconds of a snippet, like walking in, maybe the front interior, um, bar shots, if, there, if someone's making a cocktail, if someone's doing food, uh, specific jewelry they have for sale. And I just jump in and out of really quick snippets of things and then compose them together uh, within, it, generally speaking, it probably took me about an hour to edit things that would only be 30 seconds to a minute long, but that's generally what you gotta expect with video editing. Uh, any minute of sh a shot is going to maybe take about an hour to do it. Mm -hmm. But that's also why I work with a lot of other independent people because they know the shortcuts. They know the w ways to put it together. One of the groups that we worked with that's right here on our main street, um, we would go out, film something. And within 30 minutes, he had an entire video back to me. And those are just different prices. We ha we're lucky enough that uh, the college Rutgers is right by us. So I've worked with some students. Quality might not be as great, but just as well. An iPhone can shoot at the same quality of my DSLR uh, can. So some of that stuff, you don't, if you're just sharing it on social media, you're not trying to put it on a projector screen, mm -hmm. a phone video works great. And it it's will true. do just as good as a $1,000, $2,000 camera system. So you can find new people that haven't done video work before and are looking to get into it. And they're going to try a lot harder and not cost as much. And that's kind of how we've been doing it uh, between all of our businesses. And we cover the costs. So I just have a sign up page. Businesses come to us. They set a time and a date. We show up 30 minutes and then we send it back to them within like uh, two to three days. That, 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 that is awesome. And just full disclosure, you know, I'm using a cell phone that's like five years old. For, for this thing, hence the backwards selfie stuff. So, I mean, you don't, you, you don't even need like an iPhone 2500 or whatever they're up to now to, to, to do this. So, um, yeah, Courtney, I don't, I don't know if, if you can find the Hamilton, if you could find I the- put it, I put it in there. Well, what I meant is if you could actually find the Hamilton, the link to the Hamilton video and share screen oh. for that video, because it is an awesome like 20 second video uh, for their outdoor dining program. I, I'm having trouble finding it on my end. Um, cause I'm using my personal, not the state computer. So I'm, I'm I've kind yeah, of lost, hold on, I can, to, but yeah, Ham, Hamilton. So, so with NPP Hamilton, they, they, they use our money to buy a lot of outdoor uh, space heaters and they created some parklets and other things like that. And then they used a uh, New Jersey tourism, tourism marketing grant to, um, work with a, a person named Cindy Williams, uh, out of, out of, uh, Ber Berlin borough down in South Jersey, uh, to create, um, a series of videos, uh, for their downtown in, um, in in during this COVID winter, if you will, and uh, they they they've just done really fa fantastic work. And again, I wish I had the link handy, but um, uh, Jeff, I, I have their videos up. Is it the holiday season one or the bundle up dine out? Yeah, I think I, I think it's the bundle up dine the out. The bundle up. Okay, yeah, hold on one it's... second. Let me yeah, press yeah. pause and then screen share. Yeah, I'll, I mean I'll recognize it when it comes up, but but um, yeah. starts with a heat lamp. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, because those are the ones we bought. Here we go. Nice. Now I want a, a, a mule and some chocolate uh, cake. <laughs> <laughs> On, Carla shared the uh, out, New Brunswick outdoor dining video as well, which is awesome. So Great. that's cool. Yeah, we created a, um, a two minute 
commercial, and then we created two 30-second uh, commercials uh, on the onset uh, during the summertime uh, to promote our outdoor dining and performances. We got a lot of good responses from that too. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I reposted some of them. I, I, I subscribe to, you know, I like New Brunswick, so I see their stuff come up and the videos for what, you know, videos always, that there's algorithms, right? So those videos come up. Anything else anyone wants to uh, discuss? Sherry, you're on mute. I see your lips moving, but. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was going to make a plug for maybe smaller communities that, you know, video production may be out of their realm, but don't forget, you may have a lot of wealth in realtors that are local that are doing a lot to promote your, your districts. So they may have video content that you could borrow or partner with in some way. Awesome. That's a good idea. Well, great point. Yeah. I think Hamilton's a pretty small district too. So for them to pull that together. Um, yeah, it's, it's outsized in performance, but yeah, they, they leverage a lot of great resources. And again, they had the tourism dollars to back that oh. up. So. And uh, this is Carla Cefalo. I also, uh, yeah, while you're talking about tourism dollars, you know, the letter of intent to do today. And, you know, that's a great uh, way to take advantage uh, of, you know, getting funding for these videos through that uh, uh, cooperative marketing grant. Who's that out of? Is New that Jersey Travel and Tourism? Okay, um, I'm going to look put, that up. Oh, could, if you yeah. have it. Yeah, if you have it, a, if you I'll put, put a up, link. Great. The letter of intents are due today. Uh, the announcement came out on Tuesday, I believe, Jeff. I think um, so. But, the announcement um, came out Tuesday and today's the day. Wow. They, it's, they just, you... it's just the letter of intent. You know, stuff's really, I notice a lot of stuff's coming out late, but um, it, yeah. it's just a simple letter of intent. And then you have time to do complete the um, application on SAGE. But uh, we definitely um, have received funding in the past in, um, you know, our, our nonprofit um, for videos. And, and again, put, putting them out there on the YouTube channel and continuing to grow. They definitely look, you know, at that as a, an, you know, a good opportunity to fund. Great. Yeah, I, I found it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just putting the link. Go yeah. Ahead. But the declaration it says approximately March 5th. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that means. Well, because I, I think, you know, because it came out late and people kind of, you know, approximately, I think if you send it Monday, you'll be okay. You'll, you'll be okay. But I don't want to speak for them. I don't want anybody after me from tourism. <laughs> right, right, Jeff? No, we definitely don't want tourism as our friend. So that's for sure. Great. But it's the uh, co-op market marketing uh, grant. Great, thank you, Carla. Yeah. And I'll, I'll actually get a social media post. I, 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 this one got past me, so I'll get this up and out, and hopefully people see it and can at least, hopefully the uh, declaration of intent isn't too hard. Um, no, it's it's very simple. Okay. It's just a simple letter, you know, letting them know you intend to apply and for what. Great. Anything else? Hey, Courtney. Yes. Oh, hey, David. How are you? Good, good. A great resource for um, videos is something right in our own backyard. It's interns, high school, college students. They're doing videos in their sleep, one click. We have an intern who's so video savvy. You know, we do a little, we did our little crisp last year, our holiday video, restaurants. You go out, they edit it. It's a, you don't have to look too far, you know, yeah. they're right here. Absolutely. Your own children, probably. Yeah. <laughs> For those of us with younger children, she's definitely more tech savvy than me. And they can put together a really cute video with music and graphics. And, you know, they're so savvy now that you could do it. In a, they do it in a second. Yeah. I just wanted to make a plug um, for thanking Jeff. He's had 25 years experience, I think, in this mm -hmm. profession. So we've been the beneficiary of a lot of your experience and your smooth video that you did and Courtney for putting it together. And to build off of Robin's point from part one, that, um, you know, downtown New Jersey, uh, for me, 
has always been a place where I could learn a lot and be connected with the development community. Um, but now I see the organization pivot to provide a lot of really needed service and resources to fellow practitioners. Um, so um, I do agree with Robin that it has um, been so invaluable. And um, you know, for those of you who may be on the call, don't forget downtown New Jersey is a not nonprofit. So uh, we need membership. <laughs> so if you're not a member, um, please become a member and um, encourage your own towns to become members too, because that's the way that Courtney um, can continue to bring this kind of programming. You're here. Sherry. Thank you. And yeah, and, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. All right. Sounds like people want to want to end their week soon. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff, it was, it was wonderful. Thank you uh, for letting us be a part of, of what you pulled together. It really was fabulous. And I look forward to getting all of the various videos up on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, I will, um, and we'll get lots of views hopefully. So sorry, I was I was reading a direct message in the chat while I was saying this. I got distracted. Um, thank, thank you, thank you, Courtney, for doing all the logistics and for supporting this crazy idea. And uh, uh, thank you all for your time and patience today. And perhaps the last time, if you saw that, and if you can watch it in retrospect, then feel free to do that online. And and everyone have a wonderful weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend. And oh, one pitch. The next one is April sixteenth, and it's uh, the re retail real estate market uh, one year later. Uh, so it's, uh, with, um, Marta person via who we had last year at the same time. So oh, that'll be good. That'll yeah. Be good. Yeah. Yeah. She's All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. All right. Take care. Be well. <laughs>